A very good afternoon to all of you and uh, uh, after a long morning and uh, just before lunch it's always going to be hard uh, to keep the attention of the people and but we have a very distinguished panel of experts uh, in different areas and uh, different backgrounds and hopefully we'll make it interesting for all of you uh, and we will have something interesting to talk about uh, on this very topic of uh, beyond uh, 2030, beyond SDGs 2030. Now, we are trying to debate and deliberate about uh, what are the new perspectives, pathways and solutions that we could look at going beyond this 2030 time frame that we all have for achieving SDGs. So it's probably time for us to take stock in terms of the approaches that uh, we have been adopting or have adopted to uh, formulate as well as implement uh, SDGs as they are uh, and take a fresh look at how we want to reshape uh, achievement of just not just these SDGs but going beyond this 2030 time horizon that we have uh, and that's that's uh, uh, the agenda for our current session. I think uh, one of the important things we noticed uh, going through the experience of SDGs is that uh, it is, it, there's a lot of fragmented approach there. I think there is a lot of intersectionality between the SDGs and there is a need for holistic approach. That's been uh, missing in a way when you try to look at each of them as separate goals and not considering the intersectionality aspect of it and what are the challenges that are there at the ground level in terms of implementation. And second thing is uh, learning is that uh, uh, at least from the India experience, we can say that when you take this to the grassroots and uh, let the people own the development agenda, then you see success. That's what we have demonstrated through the 17 stories, 17 case studies that we have put in this book. In terms of the involvement of people, as I uh, often say, it is about the people involvement which makes uh, something su successful, uh, particularly to do with the agenda, because they are the ones who, for whom we are setting this agenda. UN Secretary General, uh, in his uh, in, in the UN's report of Sustainable SDGs 2023, himself said, actually, the, we need a new Bretton Woods moment, uh, because the old systems have failed. Uh, it's, it's been amply clear to everybody. Now, UN Secretary General has said, the Prime Minister of India has recently said, uh, post G20, uh, that we need to relook at the institutional frameworks post 2030, uh, or actually going from now in terms of how we want to achieve uh, the development across the globe. Where, I, as the Secretary General also said, uh, we need to give voice uh, to the global south or to the uh, uh, people where uh, we need to deliver this more than anywhere else. So these are some of the things that uh, we have as a background in terms of where we are. And clearly there are a bunch of questions that all of us need to answer here. What I, starting from what are the chief lessons learned from whatever we have seen over the last uh, eight years uh, when we had set up that asp those aspirational goals. Uh, then we have to also look at who are the key actors who might uh, uh, define the next phase of international development and what, what kinds of new strategic partnerships and uh, structures going beyond, beyond the current institutional frameworks that exist for uh, global development agenda in order to ensure sustainable and inclusive transformation. One of the couple of things which uh, I think one needs to consider while discussing these SDGs or any subsequent successors to SDGs is uh, to bring in equity and resilience as much and as integral part of uh, the development agenda as sustainability itself. So the question of sustainability, if sustainability became into question because uh, so many SDGs where we made progress, we regressed in the last few years, uh, then we need to be really thinking about resilience as well. So that's, that's what I mean by holistic approach to uh, development in terms of equity, sustainability and resilience as we go along, go, go further. And uh, as we measure our progress, uh, what are we looking at the overall well-being of, of the humanity? 
that's 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 an underlying thing which we need to be looking at uh, in whatever we discuss uh, uh, here you know, humanity well-being of the humanity and the happiness part of it and how do we ensure new technologies are reducing inequities and not actually increasing those inequities that's that's a, a question that i have for some of the panelists actually i will come to because uh, uh, you know there there are new inequities that are emerging as a result of access or inaccess inaccessibility of technology for uh, some people with this thought i am delighted uh, to have uh, uh, a distinguished panel as shubh has introduced and uh, we will start with the uh, questions may may i start with uh, uh, maria maria espinosa uh, with your vast experience with the un system and as uh, being a political leader as well of ecuador so who you think who are who do you think are the key actors who might define the next phase of international development and how do we ensure that uh, the important voices are not left unheard and how do we ensure this community first approach uh, from your experience so that uh, we develop an inclusive uh, agenda going forward thank you um and uh, to the organizers especially to RF for bringing us together to to discuss this very critical issue just a few hours after the adoption of uh, the SDG declaration after the summit i think it's uh, you know the the perfect timing for us to discuss what comes after and uh, what are the lessons learned and uh, you you said it so well in the introduction uh, mr moderator uh, you know to implement the 2030 agenda to deliver uh, on the sdgs uh, requires a whole of society approach this is not the respons responsibility of national governments only but local governments uh, communities also uh, academia the private sector it has to be a collective endeavor and um, this phrase um, that uh, came together with the SDGs and the 2030 agenda, leave no one behind, has to be applied in the agency uh, to make the changes that are needed. Uh, the news and um, every single report on progress of the SDGs is more disheartening than the other. And when we see that only 50%, 15%, uh, one five, of the targets uh, have been met and uh, there is regression uh, in, in almost 10% of the targets. Not only we have not advanced, but we have regressed. These are really not good news. And when we see, for example, what are the, um, the issues where we are lagging behind are the most critical issues for the future of humanity. We're lagging behind in mitigation commitments on climate change, we are lagging behind on financing for development. We are lagging behind on gender equality. Uh, you know, women, we, we are half, half of the world's population and we are being left behind. So it's impossible to think of a future that not only places women and girls at the center, but in a way uh, where there is power sharing uh, with men and uh, we have you know the, the the power and the the, the leadership positions that that we deserve and uh, the other critical issue is the growth of a uh, extreme poverty and the growth of inequalities so a world with greater inequalities including gender inequality a world with more poor people um, and a world which is climate and safe it's really uh, you know not a very promising future However, um, in spite of this very bleak picture, uh, we had a political declaration of the SDGs that uh, I have to be very frank, uh, it was much more than what I expected. And uh, the, I, I really, for the ones that haven't read yet the political declaration, I think it's something that we need to look uh, carefully. There, there is a commitment for a, uh, a financial stimulus for the SDGs of 500 billion for developing countries per annum 
Um, and there is also the commitment uh, to uh, look carefully at uh, debt restructuring mechanisms, because as we know, 61 countries in the world are in debt distress. And uh, some countries, and not few, are paying more in debt service than what they are investing in health and education. So uh, th that is the picture. Your question was about, you know, who are the key actors in all of these? Again, I think it's, it's, it's really a collective endeavor. It's a collective effort. But it is also leaders recommitting to the 2030 agenda. It is about political will, but it is about massive public investment, especially for the groups that have been traditionally marginalized. Uh, the situation of the countries in the global south is extremely difficult because they do not have the fiscal space, the, the policy space they need to deliver on the 2030 agenda. So uh, I think that we, we need to bring the very good outcome of the SDG summit, the political declaration, to craft and boost a, the pact for the future because we, we are preparing for the summit of the future. And keep the traction going to the social summit in 2025. I would leave it there and, uh, you know, very, very eager to hear from my co-panelists here. Uh, thank Over you. to you. Thank you for those comments. And uh, I think the underlying thing is a uh, political will uh, and uh, su uh, supported by financing. Uh, I think uh, the most important thing is uh, when it's good to have all plans and agenda. But if it's not backed by both of these things, uh, they'll remain on paper. We'd, we will not see the results. So I actually consider what we need to do is uh, going beyond uh, 2030 or SDGs even from now onwards. SDGs are focused on social, economic, and environmental. I think we need to add two letters to this, SEE. We need to add one T and P. In fact, that add, that's steep. Uh, morning, Ambassador Kambos was talking about uh, the path ahead is steep to get the SDGs to uh, 2030. So the T is about technology and the P is about political uh, will. Uh, so this is the steep part of it we need to address. So going further from that, uh, uh, my next question is on technology and its role to Dr. Luciana Servo. Uh, what do you think in the context of uh, fourth industrial revolution and the emergence of technology, the pace at which it is growing, uh, what, are, are we going to see different levels of inequity? And uh, uh, are we going to leave some people behind? And how do we avoid uh, the pitfalls of creating uh, new sets of uh, inequality, new types of uh, inequality in the society? Well, thank you very much for the organizers to have me here. It's a great opportunity to talk since in a few months, India will be handing over the G20 to Brazil and you'll be engaged in this discussion and to continue this debate. In fact, I think that we have seen from all the revolu revolutions, industrial revolutions, that inclusion was not part of it. You have seen that industrial revolutions have not bring the inequalities and inequities in the world down. What we've seen is that the 50% of the population is not the, the ones who have the most part of the income. But besides that, we have not seen a, a great amount of reduction in the racial inequalities, for example, in the indigenous people, inclusion in the society in the sense that they might be respected. And also we have not seen a treatment of the space of the environment who brings this inclusion to the process. And in this technological uh, revolution, the fourth industrial revolution, I think we are doing, committing the same mistakes. If you look at how we are going to put the revolution to work for well-being, in fact, we are not doing that so well. For example, you have a lot of digital technologies who were brought and they could increase a lot the educational access for the whole population. They could increase the health access to the, a lot of people in the world. They could bring small farmers together with the market. They could bring a lot of people together in cultural exchange. But what you've seen, in fact, is that 
the agriculture has not been doing good in sense of inclusion. It has been a lot of technology advance in the agriculture, but the, it's not for food. It's not for reducing hunger and poverty. Besides that, when you look at the what happens in the pandemics, for example, in Brazil, we start the pandemics, most of the population in Brazil has not a way to start the educational process using digital technologies. We, they were lack behind of the ones who are richer in Brazil. And this does not happen only in Brazil. It happens in a lot of the countries that are underdeveloped or in, been in the medium development criteria in some sense. So to think of the revolution, industrial revolution, as an inclusion, we have to really think the technologies of a part of a process that considers inclusion as central and on, not only the economic aspects of it, not only the commercial aspects of it. So if you think of industrial revolution in the sense that we're going to bring people closer to market, we're going to bring the kids closer to a high technological inclusive education, this has to be fought now because we are leaving a lot of people behind. We've been, our president has been here in the US discussing the platforms. And there are a lot of workers in the world working for platforms and they are income or wage in some sense because it's a kind of job are decreasing. They are working more and more and they are receiving less and less. So if you don't think as society, as inclusion of the center of the industrial revolution, we are going to commit the same mistakes. So inclusion has to be in the center. Social has to be in the center. It has to be social, environmental, and economic together, not economic and all the rest. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. And uh, I think uh, inclusion is the key thing, when, even when we talk about technological uh, rev uh, revolutions and the implementation of those. So moving on, uh, uh, I would go to uh, Dr. Alakija. Uh, when we talk of uh, inequities, and uh, just now we heard about the inclusion part of it to do with technology. Now, SDG 5 is something we need to highlight as long as we have not reached the desired goals. Uh, well, SDG 5 talks about gender equity. In this context, uh, given your background with WHO and the Act, uh, what do you, key actors need to keep in mind to ensure uh, women uh, you know, have their say or their role in terms of leading the health agenda, uh, especially for those coming from the global south for the next phase of uh, development dialogues. And what measures are being taken to address intersectionality? I mentioned, talked about intersectionality of the uh, SDGs as they are today, and in ensuring that women from marginalized and underserved communities uh, have equal access to leadership opportunities too. Thank you very much um, for the question and thank you so much um, to ORF, the organizers. I'm looking at Shub. Thank you for all the hard work um, to get us all here. Um, it's wonderful to be back with my Indian family in this setting. First of all, to co correct sort of the, in your work with WHO, I don't work for WHO. I'm a special envoy um, for the Access to COVID Tools Accelerator. And I, I, I give that that um, clarification because it's broader than just working with an organization, this issue of gender. And to, to bring to, to mind that the moment that my sister just mentioned, the pandemic, in the pandemic when I was invited um, to be the to be the co-chair together with a man who's a prom former prime minister from Sweden, Carl Bildt, I was invited to co-chair the ACT Accelerator and also to be the special envoy to lead the development of products, the vaccines, the, thera the diagnostics, the therapeutics to strengthen the health systems all around the world. I was just saying, um, you know, in a little conversation with Melissa Fleming just then and with my friend Shombi, that one of the sh most shocking things to me when I entered my first meeting was that I was the only woman in the room. Um, of everybody who was deciding what we were going to do for the world and how we were going to save the world during COVID, there were nine men and I was the only woman. Um, those nine men worked incredibly hard. They worked every, we met every Thursday, um, the heads of Gavi, the heads of 
Gates Foundation, the heads of um, WHO, the heads of CEPI, the heads of Wellcome Trust. You know, I call them my big nine, my big nine brothers. And I would tell them that one day I hope to have more sisters in this group. Um, why do I bring that to the fore? You talked about gender, but gender is only a part of it. Challenging the system for transformation is what we need as a global community. The entire system and the ecosystem in which we function as a global community needs to be challenged and needs to be changed. It's not just about bringing women tokenistically to the table. It's about making sure that their voices can not only be heard, but that they are not pushing back. Today, I had a very disturbing um, encounter. I just spoke at the the at a breakfast, a ministerial breakfast on on how do we prepare for the next pandemic. And a woman approached me and she said, Dr. Alakaja, you're a strong woman. You're a strong voice. And she had tears in her eyes. And she said, the system is fighting back at me. She works within a system. She's really quite senior. A system is fighting back at me. Can I talk to you? The systems we work in have to be challenged, not just for, and I'll go to intersectionality with that, because it's not just for women. It's for women there's intersectionality even within women. There's women from the global south. There's women of color. There's women from, you know, there's there's there, there's those who 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 identify as women. I mean, it's all or or identify as other. It's all across the board. So really, you know, you talked about a new Bretton Woods moment at the very beginning, and that resonated with me with a lot of things because as we look towards and you know congratulations on the political commitment for the and the declaration for the SDG but surely it is time that we move beyond declarations to action it is time that we just stop talking and we just stop having political leaders say I commit because they have committed so many times before but I'm not seeing the change and the only way to have that change is to have some action I spoke at the high level meeting on pandemic preparedness um, a couple of days ago where we also adopted a political declaration and my question to that room was if we took all the money that had been used to to stage UNGA and to put together UNGA this year because my topic was financing and if we put that into financing health systems systems in Brazil, in my native Nigeria, in your Ecuador, maybe that will be, be a change. Maybe we pause UNGA for one year and we take all of that funding and we go and pour it into health systems and maybe we pause it another year and we go and pause and pour it into education. Maybe that will bring the change and then we can come back in five years and maybe by then we'll be able to say, okay, we're online to actually achieve the SDGs because we have put our money where our mouths are. We have walked the talk. We are actually doing something. So, I mean, I posit that the targets, you know, back to what you said about the new Bretton Woods moment referencing um, Antonio Guterres, the world in 1947, 1948 was a very different world to the one we have now. The Bretton Woods institutions were put together to fix Europe, quite rightly. And therefore they were crafted and they were designed in the image and the, and, and the very likeness of those with whom they were meant to serve. The problems today are in different parts of the world. Europe was fixed, well, I mean, inshallah, as they say. <laughs> You know, I mean, Europe was was fixed and th those problems were sorted out. But then we see problems in, you know, in the Amazon, Amazonia, um, Amazon forest in Brazil, in my native Nigeria, my my con my beloved continent, Africa is riven by conflict, by poverty, by 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 by, by disease. And yet the inequality, inequality inequalities persist and we are still working with the old systems that were built to fix a set of problems that are today are a different set of problems. So you cannot use old tools to fix new problems. You cannot put new, wi new wine in an old wineskin. It will break. And that is what we're seeing today. Even if you look at what's going on here this week, only one of the P5 is here at Unger this year. We're trying to pour new wine into an old wineskin and the wineskin is, 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 is crumbling before our eyes. So it is time really that we as a global community and we the people with the voice, you also spoke about, you know, where is the new, the new leadership coming from? The new leadership, leadership is coming from the South. And it's exciting that Brazil, we're seeing this troika of G20 presidencies, and we need to begin to infiltrate, seems like a really shady word, but we need to begin to, you know, work together, us from the South and those from the North, but we from the South must begin stronger South-South collaborations. It is not just about women. Yes, it's about women, it's about gender, but it's much deeper than that. It is a systemic in inequality. It is the, syste the systems with which we need, we, 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 we 
live are fundamentally broken. And my question is, how do we, as we the people, how do we solve that? Thank you. Thank you for those excellent remarks. A recent G20 kind of set uh, the path for uh, inclusion of our rather larger say or role of Global South by including African Union as well into that. Uh, that was a big moment uh, for uh, the new global order, I must say. So uh, hopefully uh, that will lead us to uh, including the voice of the South in terms of setting the agenda as well as finding solutions to implement, uh, which is the important thing actually. From there, I move on to uh, Ankur, uh, who represents uh, the private sector philanthropy. Uh, he's from BMGF, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Uh, so Ankur, uh, could you share with us uh, uh, you just completed your goalkeepers annual goalkeepers event uh, where you uh, bring in uh, people from across the world in terms of uh, sharing their experiences, their lived experiences in terms of what they have gone through, how they have brought innovations uh, and uh, how do they contribute to the achievement of goals. Uh, so from that perspective, uh, uh, how do you see these collaboratives between the large uh, uh, foundations, the public sector, and uh, these various uh, actors acting at the grassroots uh, as collaboratives to achieve the agenda? Um, we are at the halftime of the SDGs, and it's clear, many people have said this, we're way behind. I think collaboratives like the goalkeepers, so there are many of them, they're great because they allow us to take stock of how we're doing, and effectively ask the question, what do we need to do in the second half? And I think the strategy of continuing the same game plan is a bad strategy. And so we do need to reinvent and refresh our thinking. And I think it's been exciting over the last week to hear some of those ideas. I'll talk about two things. The first one is about who's at the table. We need to rethink that. And I think in the panel before, and a lot of my colleagues talked about it, I think this idea about women-led development, it's fundamental. I think, like, to my esteemed colleague's point, if one out of the 10 people who are in the room and is, are talking about how we're gonna rethink the world in the future, how we're gonna solve the problems, I think we've just got it fundamentally wrong. It's not just the right thing to do, it's also the smart thing to do. And so I think so, we need to change who's at the table. <clears throat> The second thing is around um, who's at the table is, again, we talked about this, the G20, the Troika. I think the South puts a different agenda at the table. They look at development in a different manner. Um, I don't think for the longest time, we've had this Bretton Woods financial architecture for the last 45, uh, 75 years, 70 years. I don't think people were questioning how that system was designed in the past. I think so we're asking fundamental questions. I don't know the answer to what a new system looks like, but clearly a system that was designed 75 years back when half of the world was a colony of Europe, clearly that can't be the right system. And I think we're asking questions like that. I love that. The third thing in terms of who's, um, who's at the table and who's different, youth. The energy, the excitement, I think they're basically saying we're impatient about the development pathway. This notion that it's going to take 300 years for gender equality. Are you kidding me? Like they are asking different questions and I think so it's exciting. So that's one part, which is who's at the table is very different and we need to rethink and refresh that. The second part of it is around innovation. I work at the Gates Foundation. We think about risk capital. We think that we need to continue doing the things that the world does right now, but sometimes it's like pushing water uphill. You do need to find ways around it. Innovation is not the solution to everything, but innovation can be a solution to many things. For example, digital public infrastructure, what India did, and more than that, digital financial inclusion, which is I am going to make it possible to bank the people who are unbankable 20 years back because the economics of brick and mortar banking just does not work. We went from, in India, we went from 26% women having access to a financial account to 78%. That kind of change, 
you are not going to get that kind of change through a small innovation. And 78% is a good number. There's lots that need to be done on top of that. But we need to imagine solutions like that. I'll end on one more innovation that I'm excited about, and this is a, a big part of what our um, goalkeepers report was about, which is, and this is a shocking statistic, 10 million children were dying before the age of five. So before the fifth birthday, 10 million children would die every year. And this was in 2000s. That number today is 4.6 million. It's less than half of the number. It's a great achievement for the world. It is still 4.6 million children dying. We talked about seven innovations in this report, seven simple innovations, things like how do I help a baby breathe who's born premature? But a baby breathing, and we've got solutions to this one. And if you scale up these seven interventions, and there's many of these, you could save two million children. Uh, you could prevent two million children from dying before their fifth birthday. That's kind of an amazing thing. So I love, we need to, so I'm gonna end with saying that Einstein's definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. That just doesn't work. And so we need to reinvent, we need to refresh, and I'm excited about that. Great, uh, I think uh, reinventing, reimagining, refreshing, resetting actually is the way to go forward. And a uh, couple of points from what you said, one is of course the innovation part of it and do it in a disruptive way, uh, not uh, the good old way or bad old way actually. Uh, that's that's uh, the other uh, important uh, takeaway I get from what you said. Uh, and clearly uh, there is a lot one can do if we implement uh, these things. Obviously it needs to be done it all the way from the top at global to uh, grassroots uh, level. One of the important points uh, which I think when we talk about inclusivity is the inclusivity of youth. Uh, while a lot is talked about uh, inclusivity of gender, I think inclusivity of, inclusivity of youth more so in the global south where the populations are still steadily growing, increasing. And so the proportion of youth in the global south is a lot more than the proportion of youth in the global north. So what are we doing about it is a point I think worth debating about uh, as we go further in terms of the agenda for future. Uh, so now I turn to Professor Panagaria, who is an economist, a well-known economist. Can I just make one point? Yes, uh, I, I don't think many people would appreciate this, but in 2050, one in two person who's gonna join the workforce is going to be from Africa. And that's the point I was making, Just, like, uh, you know, we are, we are probably missing that aspect of it, that dimension of uh, development. Uh, well, uh, last few years, uh, thankfully, the gender part has come into the mainstream, uh, but the youth part is uh, not necessarily getting the traction. So it's worth pursuing that. Yeah. One, one second as well. I have to also really agree with you. And really in that spirit, although she will kill me, I would almost want to yield my place on this panel to a young person who is also a goalkeeper who was part of that session um, this week because youth should be at the table. She's an Afro-Brazilian. She's African. She's Brazilian. And she's a young person. I yield my seat. <laughs> Would you want to quickly introduce yourself before I turn to Professor Panagaria? Um, hello, everyone. Uh, really lovely to unexpectedly be on this stage. Um, my name is Danielle Alakaja, as you can tell by the matching face of the person who's just thoroughly embarrassed me. Um, but uh, I run a climate incubator. So what we do is we, I'm also a goalkeeper, so thank you very much for a lovely event. Um, but what we do is we monitor, we are focusing on health metrics at the moment, but we monitor certain metrics for climate change effects of populations, global south population specifically. Um, so we look at migration, we look at displacement, we look at air quality, water quality. We also look at soil quality 
and food production because um, I think that's something that we're not really focusing on at the moment. We're not looking at what are, for me personally, I grew up in Fiji. And so that long-term you know, picture of what do my nieces and nephews, what do the children, you know, I say children, I'm 27, so what do we, I'm very firmly holding on to that young people label for as long as possible. Um, you know, what, what are young people of today looking at in terms of long-term health effects over circumstances that we've largely had no control over? And I mean, my favorite saying on the planet is, I don't think you should be allowed to vote after the age of 60, I'm so sorry. Um, but I don't, because at the end of the day, it's not your future. And you're deciding on policies that really aren't going to affect you. Whereas my generation is sitting here being told that, you know, perhaps we're not invested because we're scrolling on TikTok or we're distracted because we've got selfie tripods and we're taking pictures in Times Square. But at the end of the day, this generation is incredibly engaged and we're engaged because we're scared and we're anxious. And that brings you to my final metric. We monitor mental health of young people as well in relation to climate change, because a lot of people are looking forward and thinking, I don't want to have kids because I don't know what my future looks like in 20, 30, 40 years time. So how can I in good conscience bring someone else into this? Thank you. Thank you for sharing your uh, uh, thoughts on this. And I think this is, this is something which uh, we have to take home in terms of uh, having our next events like this, uh, where we should have at least half of the participants or the panelists as uh, youth uh, uh, in terms of uh, conveying, to, giving them a platform to share their uh, expectations and aspirations. Uh, it's a very important uh, uh, point that we, we have to take home actually. Thank you. Uh, so Professor Panagaria, she talked about metrics actually. Uh, so that's a good segue uh, to talk about metrics in terms of you are an economist and uh, Looking at the SDGs, so I've, I went through a study which classified the indicators of SDGs into three categories, 93 of which are entire ones that are conceptually clear and have data from about 50% of the countries, only 50% of the countries. 72 are entire two, which are conceptually clear, but no comparable data from countries at all. And the rest are entire three, which have no established measurement methodology. With such incomplete metrics, how really are we assessing our progress, our failure, our successes? Is there a need to establish a more robust standoff measurement for these metrics that can show us the actual progress and that can be used across geographies and goals so that when we refer to something, we are all talking the same thing? If you really kick me out, I think this panel will become much better. <laughs> So, uh, but nevertheless, uh, uh, since uh, I have to uh, do my duty now as the organizers have uh, uh, put me here, uh, to answer your question first maybe and then I want to make a couple more uh, comments if I could. Uh, one of the things I have felt, you know, now economists look uh, at things from 10,000 feet, uh, so it's a little different perspective. Uh, um, uh, unlike you know the rest of the panel here, which uh, works much more uh, at the grassroots, let's put it that way. Um, my own view, you know, uh, I also served as India's G20 Sherpa for three years, uh, uh, and uh, the first VNR of uh, of SDGs uh, of India, uh, I, I had presented. Uh, uh, so so in that capacity, I had also you know. Uh, one of the things I have felt all along in, in this is that uh, we put in too many targets uh, and, and that is sort of underlying the question that you have raised. Uh, uh, if, you know, in the end our resources are limited and it is important to sort out which are the really, really important targets. And if you hit many of these, you know, very important targets, I, I, I think some of the other targets automatically kind of get taken up. Um, but otherwise, given, I mean, there is a simple theorem that uh, you need at, at least as many bullets uh, as you have targets to hit, uh, unless, you know, some of the targets are aligned in a single line, in which case with one bullet, unusually could hit two. But, but in that case, anyway, uh, you don't need the two targets, only one target. Um, so, 
first of all, I'll very much pitch for, for the future, where we pick bigger things. So that's, that's my one reaction. Uh, and also when we pick up these things, uh, particularly, uh, I think you know, things that are important have to be picked up whether or not you can measure them. Uh, uh, so what is important is important regardless of whether it's, but then if there are secondary targets there, I think you know, one should pay a bit more attention uh, to what, what is measurable and what is not measurable. In terms of measurable also, not all measurements are equal. I, you know, outcomes are far more important than inputs. Not as again, you know, at the Niti IO, when when I served for three years, uh, 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 and, and we used to write the, do these indices of various various things. My insistence always was that look, you know, two thirds of the weight ought to go to the outcomes. You got to measure the outcomes. If you're measuring the inputs, I, I've gone to the website of the SDGs of the United Nations uh, and, and looked at this and lots and lots of these are just inputs. But how do I know? You spend this much money you, uh, on this, you spend that much money on this. How do I know what it produced? Because the leakages in these expenditures are just endemic. So uh, the effectiveness of the expenditure matters and that's measured through outcomes. So there ought to be much greater weight on measuring the outcomes than measuring the inputs. Uh, th those who do the measurement, of course, meaning you know, all my staff at uh, at the NITIO would uh, very much want to, you know, when, so the first set of things that will come to define the index, they would almost always kind of uh, have 80, 90 percent of the things that are inputs because they think they can measure those. Right? I mean, they're spending the money and therefore it can be measured. But to me, that's not not what what uh, will define the progress. It's, it is the uh, outcomes that will define the progress. So that's what we have to focus on. Now, on a slightly different kind of uh, 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 note, um, I am sort of an optimist. And one of the things we ought to do really focus a lot more on the progress that we make. And I think we're making progress. Now, my lens happens to be India, so I see things from you know, what is happening in India. Uh, clearly, you know, ultimately, the focus has to shift uh, from Asia to Africa big time. Uh, I mean, the, the, the analogy I see here is that when Prime Minister Modi came, uh, you know, he uh, started focusing on the development of the Northeast, which had been for 70 years a neglected region of India. And it's made big difference. And so in, in, it, I think, you know, that kind of lens to me says that if we really focus con in a concentrated way on Africa, I think we can really make huge progress. If the entire globe comes together and really focus in a serious way, I think huge progress can be made and you know 1.5 billion people are uh, are, are uh, there uh, uh, potentially and and and, and as, as we said in the workforce one out of two I think that's a glaring that's a sort of dramatic figure um, that might sort of uh, among several points one last point I want to make here is that we should not forget uh, and this is again the economist speaking uh, the growth is extremely important. Let's not forget uh, that ultimately, and, and this is again my own experience from India, where the growth for 40 years remained at about 3% or so, uh, and in per capita terms that translated in less than 3%. Well, that really left you, uh, 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 neither the people had enough income, uh, even if the government was able to provide public services, accessing those services, things like education, health, etc., does depend on having some minimum income. But in any case, the other side also doesn't work because if growth is not happening, then the government doesn't have the revenues. It cannot do the public goods. So the progress that India has achieved in the last 30 years as a result of this higher growth far outweighs, far, I think, than we got anything in the first 40 years. Uh, I mean, my generation completely lost out. You know, I was one of the very lucky ones who uh, uh, got, you know, by good luck, uh, 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 a scholarship to come to the U.S. And uh, uh, I escaped that, but my generation did not escape that. Uh, uh, and, and, and so I think this is, again, very, very important. We, uh, uh, you know, we tend to think that, well, growth, we leave it to the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. But that's not it. I think, you know, they worry about SDGs and likewise, you know, the United Nations should worry about the growth aspect of it also. Because if you empower the people with the income, uh, uh, they can access, uh, you know, one very simple example, because some income increases happened, mobile became available to every Indian. And so today, when uh, the government provides this public, digital public infrastructure, everybody is accessing it. 
and remarkably 40% of the digital financial transactions are happening in India. A developing country and you know even though a large developing country after all it's only 1.4 billion uh, out of 8 billion people so it's quite remarkable what you can achieve actually through through these uh, those are my thoughts one last one actually that now the g20 by the way is in the hands of the developing countries global south is really as the control yeah, and india has set a very effective g20 agenda and Brazil is uh, next and, and, and South, South Africa. Africa is next and uh, so I, I think you know uh, uh, um, there is an opportunity there to uh, really f uh, for good change the uh, tone, tenor and the agenda of G20. Uh, focused approach to achieving, uh, setting the goals actually, that's one important uh, point you made. Second is the results based uh, framework. Uh, it's not about the inputs but look at the uh, results. The third thing which uh, you, uh, I would take away from what you said is uh, focus your uh, efforts and energy on where you can make the maximum gains. Uh, Africa being one example where you have 1.5 billion people and uh, there is so much more to be done and uh, keep that at the center of what you uh, set uh, as the agenda going forward. So uh, uh, these are very important uh, thoughts I think uh, think about uh, new frameworks and uh, uh, ways to do these uh, things. And uh, I think uh, taking uh, this further, I would ask the next question to uh, Dr. Uh, Lucia Sarvo. Uh, you know, in all these uh, conversations uh, we talk about uh, in terms of the development that is going on, uh, you know, I said uh, the quality of life and uh, well-being, uh, which, which, which are key to uh, real happiness. And uh, so, so far, uh, the measurement of development has been uh, on uh, using NHDI, Human Development Index, as uh, a single index to make comparisons across countries and so on. So, uh, what should that new development index be? Because the HDI, uh, as it stands today, basically it talks about lifespan, but it misses the quality of life part of it. Uh, you know, if I were to bring in the concept of disability adjusted life years, uh, uh, you might live 80 years, but then if you are living with disability of one type or, or another, is there a quality of life? Is there well being? Is there happiness? Uh, the second was about the education. Uh, while we talk about years of schooling, but is that really resulting in effective education, uh, right? Uh, and the third is about national income, average kind of thing. But then we have seen uh, when you look at averages, uh, it doesn't address inequalities. So what is, it, what is the new measure? What is the new approach to measuring this growth? I mean, development, all these things for us going forward. Thank you very much. I would just uh, say I am also an economist <laughs> from undergrad and grad and uh, everything. But as economists, we have set the GDP as a, the main measure for it, almost everything. And this is a problem in some sense because a, a GDP, for example, was not the right measure for measuring well-being. They're not the right measure to measure welfare. And then we go to a syntax, an index that is the IDDI, the AGI, and also is not adequate for measuring well-being. I think the problem is that we're dealing with multidimensional problems, and these multidimensional problems are very hard to be in a single index. And although single index are quite attractive, they cannot be think as the only index to take the political decisions. I will take, for example, if you take the uh, IGDI as a measure and rank states in Brazil, you see a lot of differences in IDI that are not taking into account gender questions, violence, uh, youth prob uh, problems, uh, racial questions. None of this is in part of the index. So. When you're talking about quality of life, for me, someone who is always looking down, afraid of violence of the police, has no quality of life. How do you measure this? This is not a quantitative measure that is possible. You can measure through 
the youth that is dying, but it's not enough. It's not always is not enough. So what I think, yes, it's great to have syntax uh, indexes, but we not have to count on this index to take all the decisions how we are going to take policies around the world. So every time that we use an in syntax index, what we do, you decompose it and bring other information to take decision. For example, we have in my institution a vulnerable social vulnerability index that is being used as part of my institution, has a, like 50 indicators, have weights and everything. It's being used to, the, to discuss the primary health care uh, agenda. But it cannot take into account the homeless people, for example, in this index, because it's an index based about household surveys or administrative record surveys. So you have to decompose and bring homeless to the debate. So I think it's great to think about well-being. It's quite fundamental to bring the well-being measures to inside the index, but I'm not sure if a syntax index will can count for all the dimensions of well-being that we have. So I think we can go on and debate the, another measures because for sure we're taking political decisions based on GDP, on HDI, there are not enough, but going to another measure will be important, will be important to embrace other areas, but I think will not never, never be enough. Uh, so moving on to Maria Espinosa, uh, so what kind of uh, new strategic partnerships, including governance and institutional structures, given your UN experience, uh, we think we should uh, look at uh, because we recognize that Bretton Woods has failed, right? Uh, <laughs> even the UN has recognized. Uh, so what, what kind of, what would that look like, the new framework? You know, I, it's very difficult not to react to the incredible things that have been said here, uh, but perhaps I would pick up on something that you said. First of all, I love what you did, and welcome uh, to, to the table. And um, yeah, exactly, that's what we need. More voices from the youth, but not only voices, but your agency, your energy, your vision. Uh, you know, this requires a whole of society co-creation approach, and we're very happy to have you among us. But I would like to react to what you said on um, we, we should meet and let's save the money to invest uh, on you know, the huge financing gap that we have to deliver on the SDGs. And I would say, oh, that sounds like a good idea, but not quite, why? I think perhaps it would be better to channel uh, the massive public money we need for the SDGs, uh, looking at uh, a global tax pact, for example, you know, against tax evasion, which, um, you know, pre um, um, makes, uh, you know, the world lose huge amounts of money, uh, uh, illicit financial flows, for example. Uh, you know, th these perhaps are in, in, in the weapon industry and uh, in the arms race. And we know a lot recently of w what is going on around the world. Perhaps this is going to bring the trillions that are needed, you know, of, of public funding for the SDGs. And why am I saying perhaps it's not, uh, you know, because you're asking me about governance. And, and I think what we need more than ever is to talk. We need to talk. We need dialogue. We need to agree on the narratives, on, on visions for the future. And uh, the, the, the world capital for, for good diplomacy continues to be the UN. And of course, I cannot be uh, you know, impartial having been the president of the UN General Assembly, but we, we need good diplomacy more than ever, and we need to talk uh, more, more than ever. And, and perhaps uh, you know, if we agree on a, a five billion per annum on, on a stimulus for, for the SDGs, that was a good outcome. And it was worthwhile you know, coming here. It was very unfortunate that we had only one of the P5 heads of state and government present during the high level week. And it was very good that the host country was, was present. Uh, and just going to the, to the governance questions, I think that there are immediate issues that need to be, to be uh, that can be fixed. 
uh, very immediate issues. We in in again, I I am totally with Luciana. There is a whole global effort in the Beyond GDP exercise that is extremely important. You know, because not all the things that we need to value have a price and can be counted. Uh, you know, in in they are also important. So this multivariable approach uh, that uh, you have taken, I think, is important. But there is a an ongoing exercise of going beyond GDP. Uh, we do need, however, a a good quality baseline. You know, to really track the quality of our a uh, implementation record uh, in cross correct not in 2030 but in the process when we are taking the policy decisions and the investment decisions that are that are needed so a good quality baseline is 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 much needed the second issue is the the reporting capacity of countries uh, there has been uh, long conversations about how to improve the vnrs the voluntary national reviews how to learn more for the uh, from the EL, L, LNRs, the the local national uh, voluntary national reviews, cities are doing incredible incredible things at the local at the local level. Uh, the need to reform the, the the very governance and structure of the high level political forum, which is the space where countries come and report back on their on the um, progress regarding implementation, and also having served for government for a long time, the reporting requirements of the um, you know of the multilateral system are huge for small countries with small bureaucracies is extremely demanding. You have to report. Uh, you have to prepare reports for the nine human rights treaty bodies. The Universal Periodic Review, the VNRs, the NDCs, the the uh, NDCs, the the National Determined Contributions for the for the Climate, um, for the Paris Agreement, which means that we need to bring a, a one piece of macro reporting that is centralized and coherent and really um, reduces the energy and the investment countries have to do only in the reporting exercise. Um, in, in basically the issue of cross scale to connect the local uh, with the national, with the regional. Regional spaces for implementation of the SDGs are uh, extremely important. And I will close with only two headlines. Number one is uh, the communications. We need to do more and, and better so um, the public um the grassroots a uh, you know feel ownership over the SDGs and the 2030 agenda you know better and more communication and in and, and just just to close to say that this SDG summit and its outcome uh, basically we have the responsibility not only UN officials uh, there across the street but it's a collective endeavor we should keep the energy the traction the political momentum, to reach the summit of the future in 2024 and the World Social Summit in 2025. Uh, I know some people say that we are suffering from summit fatigue, but I think we have to make these two extremely important summits count because they're going to craft the path for a profound and structural reform process of the Bretton Woods, but also of the very UN institution itself that was created in a completely different geopolitical, economic, and social context. Thank you, thank you. So I think we have kind of overshot, uh, so uh, just 30 seconds each to Ankur and Professor Panagaria to give some final thoughts. I'll just say one thing, which is, we've come at these crossroads many times in terms of uh, trying to address problems that have been very difficult and Every time humanity has been at one of these crossroads, we've somehow found a way around it. So I'm quite hopeful that despite the fact that at halftime we're not doing well, that we will find a way out of it. Um, because what is at stake is very, very important. We're talking about fairness and equality. We're talking about the future of our planet. And we're talking about human dignity. So I'm quite excited that we'll find a way around it.
Thank you. And my concluding sentence is that I completely agree with Ankur. Let's have lunch. <laughs> Thank you. That seems to be a great unanimity amongst all the panelists in terms of where we need to be in the next years to come, in the years to come. And uh, thank you. Thank you. It's been a great discussion.